Hi, this is Kate Todd, and you're listening to Tobin Tonight. How did you find yourself getting that role? Yeah, that's cool. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, well, I was roughly 13 years old when I got the role. I played Lily on Radio Free Roscoe. And I had just recently gotten my first agent. And uh, RFR was one of the first auditions I was sent out on. I went on about three callbacks for the role, I believe. And I had almost no acting experience. So I, I think I was cast based on my musical ability up until that point and just having a natural kind of feel on camera. You were kind of used in the role of Shady Lane and we've also seen the musical side uh, when all four of you were on camera you sometimes broke out the guitar and even in some episodes we got to hear some of your music as well. Did you feel like the acting would help your music career or was it kind of hand in hand? Well I think for me music always came first in regards to just playing it at home. I grew up in the country and not much to do other than play music. So I think at that point, I wasn't really looking to do it professionally or anything like that. They do go hand in hand in in a certain degree, but at the same time, music is where I can express myself more personally because I write a lot of my songs and material. RFR went on for, I believe it was four seasons. The one episode that really stands out to me, and I mean, there's there is many, but of course, when you kind of dyed your hair pink and did the whole Think Pink campaign. Is there one episode in particular that uh, really stood out to you or that you liked? That Think Pink episode was so much fun, and I really liked the stance that Lily was able to kind of take, so I had a good time playing that. But there's so many mem- you know, memories and like moments in each script that make them all individually so special. When I look back, I can really sort of relive those memories but one of my favorite episodes is probably the truths about rock and roll okay and that's where we got to open for the canadian band the truths at the phoenix concert theater in toronto but yeah it was cool because i got to play my my guitar roscoe on stage and of course getting to have my two passions of music and acting come together in that kind of big way in that one episode was really cool you put it on facebook the other the other night or the other day of doing your research for this podcast um, yeah. <laughs> so i thought that was kind of interesting as well one of the things that i really liked about radio free roscoe too is just the whole aspect of it being an underground radio station i know that's kind of you know the creator's idea of it but whose idea was it to come up with the names Right. And I had to do a bit of research for that, a little bit of digging. I keep in touch with Brent Piaskowski, who was one of the writers on the show. And I reached out to him for this answer because I didn't know I didn't know that. And when you asked me about it before, I thought that was kind of a cool question. So he has a little story that I would like to share. He said that Doug and Will McRobb came up with essentially the nicknames, but he was saying that Ray was having, they were having, Network was having a hard time approving his nickname. They wanted to go with the nickname Stan because they thought it would be funny if everyone had these cool, thought-out nicknames, but Ray's was just Stan because, of course, Ray wouldn't put any (laughs) effort into coming up with a good one. So at the end, the Network didn't, didn't like it. And he, Brent said that he can clearly remember standing by Doug's office a couple of days before shooting. And Doug said, we have to find a nickname for him pronto. And then Brent and Doug both looked at each other and realized that pronto would be uh, the name. Yeah. That, and you know what? Sometimes <laughs> that's how it works. You just, you, you're so panicky or you're so kind of like, we need something fast. And someone just says something offhandingly and it just works. Right. It's funny because I think that each one, and I don't know if it was designed that way or if it was just personality wise, but I think each nickname fit each person because, you know, you had uh, Nathan's character, question mark, which was really cool because he always started off everything with a question. Uh, Then you had Smog because you didn't really know much about his character until like the later seasons. He was kind of a mystery. And then... Of course, with Pronto and Shady Lane, uh, they they kind of work hand in hand. Of course, you were the only uh, female that was on the whole RFR radio waves. So, I mean, 
it, it kind of worked into the fact that uh, it, it sounds like something like an artist would use as a name. And Shady Lane is inspired by the band Pavement, their song Shady Lane. There you go. So see, I'm not far off. I wasn't far off with that guess. <laughs> You watched them develop over time, each character. Uh, were there certain episodes that you kind of felt that it, it wasn't the best for your character or that you didn't really want to do something? Or were you kind of all in? I don't think I had any of those times. I mean, of course, it's so long ago now. For me, I guess it's almost about 13 or 15 years or something. So I remember... I mean, characters have to develop. So Lily went through her ups and downs. There were some times where I thought she was being a little bit over the top. But that's who she was, and, and that's how storylines progress. So I think for me, I wasn't ever uncomfortable with anything. But there's times where your character reacts in a way where you go, oh, you know, just calm down about that. Let's not make it worse. But of course, it's a TV show. We, we want to see things progress. Yeah, because I mean, you kind of first started off with, and this is how I seen it, so someone else might be completely different in their point of view, but you kind of started off with like the tomboyish ways because you were hanging out with the guys. Then in, I think it was maybe season two or three, you had the kind of girly aspect because you had a friend that dated Smog. And then what happened was you ended up cheating like we're cheating on your friend with smog and then you develop this kind of rock gratitude with the girl who could care less when people made fun of her and i said when i watched it from the first episode to the last i was like wow she really evolved as uh, as the character went as well right yeah she she did and like i said being the only female lead for so long i think there's just only certain amount of ways that they can take the character and that's how they chose to but um but you know getting to be able to play musician and in the end come back to the roots and realize that who she really is and that she does belong with ray was was kind of worth all the turbulent journey to get there how did you guys get along off the scene because you seemed to get along really well with all of them on camera did you enjoy their company is is kind of what i'm getting at <laughs> yeah we all we had such a great time behind the scenes i was the youngest i was always being shuttled back and forth to the school trailer <laughs> after my scenes so there was a little bit of uh isolation there on my part but like i said you know we had such a great time just so many laughs as many laughs as the directors and producers could handle from us because, of course, time is money when you're on set. But Ali, Nathan Stevenson, Nathan Carter, they were they were like brothers to me. We were just always laughing and lots of fun going on. Did, uh, did you ever feel nervous? Because I know you said you were, I think, 13 at the time. But did you ever feel nervous when it came to a, like, a kissing scene with one of the guys? <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I mean, Lily kissed a lot of people <laughs> on that series, which was... A little surprising. It didn't alarm me at the time, which is kind of alarming now. But I, I did get nervous, I think. I mean, when you're so young, you haven't had much experience in your own life, let alone knowing it's going to be filmed. And of course, back then, we didn't have social media or Instagram. So I didn't know what I looked like in every angle of doing absolutely everything in my life, like I think a lot of used to now. What do you what do you miss about the show and what don't you miss? Right. Well, you know what? There's so much that I that I miss. I mean, it's just like a family being on set, as I'm sure you know. And what I really did enjoy was the fact that I, even after the show, we got to tour across Canada to different mall tours. And I can't remember if we went to Ottawa. I believe we did. But we would have 5,000 people lined up at the mall tours to get a copy and to be able to hear how each fan was affected by RFR, how it impacted them, was something that I'll always remember. And, you know, I really enjoyed that opportunity. As far as what I don't miss, there's not there's not much because RFR was one of the best experiences of my life. And looking back from my perspective now, there's nothing really that I would change. The kind of question that just came off the top of my head here, but I'm just wondering, because, you know, you see with a lot of revivals that are coming on, TV now, like Boy Meets World, went with Girl Meets World, Full House had Fuller House. Do you think RFR, like, was it set for its time, or do you think that you could have expanded into maybe 
seven or eight seasons where you guys graduate from high school, maybe went to the same university and like developed a radio station there? Or do you think it's kind of like it's good that it ended with the fourth season? Right. Well, yeah, with all these resurgences of all the shows, like you mentioned, it's it's difficult not to kind of ask yourself that question. From my perspective, I definitely think it could work. A lot of talk was about just not sure what network would would want to do it. Um, but I definitely know there is an outreach from the fans that would love to see it, or at least that's what I kind of gather from my interactions. But I think it's definitely possible, and it would be great. It would be great to do, and I think it'd be a lot of fun. Of course, when you mentioned that there's fans that still want to see it, I, I seen when you even posted on Facebook, there was people that you know said, oh, where can I listen to the podcast? Oh, I remember watching the show. Uh, even when you go on YouTube and look at some of the clips that they put up, there's people saying, oh, this brought back my childhood. Now, I watched it on the Family Channel, and I mean, when I first saw it, I always had an interest in broadcasting, but when I saw, I guess it was like the very first episode when uh, Ray or Question Mark kind of was like, I don't want to be in the school radio, I want to develop my own, and I was thinking like, yeah, like, that's that's what I'd like to do one day, and when I was watching it, I know it's written and everything, but it was kind of cool to watch them do an underground radio show and kind of give a voice to people that maybe didn't have a voice. So I thought like, yeah, like when I, when I get older, this is what I'm going to do. And apparently uh, that is what I'm doing. So. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, nice. That's, that's great. Well, that's great to hear. I was uh, a guest at the Ted Rogers school of management in Toronto. It's a business school at Ryerson university. And I got to speak at the, the media graduation sort of event and it just it was so overwhelming the amount of people in journalism or media entertainment in some degree that would come up to me after and just say this is rfr is the reason why i'm in school and and the reason why i've graduated and to be there at that moment with them and to hear all those stories it was just it was really indescribable and super special yeah, I think it was like a, a I want to call it, it was a great Canadian TV show, kind of a great radio side of a TV show too, that like, you know, because a lot of the radio shows that were out at the time were like radio news, radio TV, um, and they were really focusing on working in a radio station, but this one was kind of, you got the dramatic atmosphere of a high school, but you also got the kind of the funny charisma side of, uh, you know, an underground radio station. So I thought that was really cool. Right. Um, and I think what I was very proud to be on it was because of it, it was it was a smart family channel, DN, which is was a subsidiary of Nickelodeon Network. And it, it was a smart show. And I think being associated with that and having the opportunity to be in a show that so many people identified with, but also respected in in a way that set it apart from different shows is something that I'm extra proud about other than just being an actress that happened to get a, you know, a cool role. So that, that is really something that I hold to my heart. And even now looking back and being able to reflect, I see just how cool that was. Actually, I would have liked to be at that uh, whole meet and greet or, you know, when you were at Ryerson, just to kind of uh, see the overwhelming reaction, because I'm sure there's plenty that came up to you and said like, oh, hey, Shady Lane or Lily and then Kate Todd. And then they went into an RFR story. I mean, I would have probably had you for like 25 minutes and then you would have said like, hey, let the other people talk as well. (laughs) I just have a few more questions that are not RFR related because you still do music so I want to talk about that when did you kind of go on your own and develop I know you've done it on RFR but when did you kind of think maybe I can do this on my own maybe I can uh, create my own kind of musical style and release my own album after Radio for Roscoe Radio for Roscoe ended I began writing an album that was never officially released but you can find it on on YouTube and and I think that was really the start of my journey of writing and just discovering myself. So obviously it's been so many years after RFR, it's a lot to catch up on. <laughs> but I continued to act on different film and TV roles. And a few to mention are Life with Derek and My Babysitter's a Vampire, as well as Tracy Fragments with Ellen Page. And I've been very fortunate to go on and be a spokesperson for many different companies and organizations, um, such as BeingGirl.ca for Procter & Gamble and the SIPO Foundation that deals with helping and inspiring youth. Okay, that's really cool. So, yeah, 
I spent my time recording and writing in the studio in Canada and Nashville, and then now I currently have four official releases. And to be able to have my music go on to be internationally recognized and, you know, network licensed is, is pretty cool. So I think for me, just the project just an opportunity that sort of appeared and I worked really, really hard honing and writing my, my music and traveling and uh, yeah, in 2016 I won Versatile Entertainer of the Year Award at the Josie Music Awards in Nashville, Tennessee and uh, and then in 2017 I'm nominated for a second time for Female Artist of the Year and Entertainer of the Year once again at the uh, the Josie's in Nashville. Oh. So it's been a, a great year and uh, pretty excited. Wow, well, con- congrats on winning and then, you know, having the chance to defend your title. <laughs> yeah, really. I will mention that one more because this is one that I'm, I'm proud about. But in 2017, I was awarded an International Women's Achievers Award for my volunteer work throughout my career. Oh. And uh, so to be recognized in this way and to kind of cap it off with the uh, the Women's Achievers Award is, is really special. And who are some of the influences basically that got you into music and who would you like to team up with or collaborate with? Well, right now I'm working with the legendary producer, Tim Thorny. He's worked with almost everyone in the industry, including Alanis Morissette, who I'm a huge fan of. And we just released my newest EP. It's called One. It's on iTunes. You can go check it out. But yeah, those people I've had the opportunity to work with are some people who I really respect, such as Seth MacFarlane on Family Guy. And, you know, countless others but for me the musicians that have influenced me as far as my music goes jackson brown stevie nicks the eagles cheryl crow jewel too many to mention really okay no those are definitely high praise do you think you'll ever come out with your own kind of version of ironic (laughs) (laughs) uh i mean there's definitely a there's definitely room for that i think this new ep i've sort of stepped out in a way it's sort of my transition EP from my teen sort of to my adult kind of years and trying to make that transition without, you know, in a more intellectual kind of cerebral way rather than going on stage and wearing next to nothing. The last question I want to finish off with here, and again, it's an opinion of your own, but do you think it's hard to make it into mainstream music or or get discovered in the Canadian market? Well, I think that the industry has changed so incredibly much. And I think that making it has a different meaning for everyone because you can be a successful musician in Canada, no problem. I mean, I have so many friends that are full-time musicians and it's great for them. But being mainstream is for some people, but I think that making really good music independently is a great way to kind of maintain your identity and the personal quality to the songs and that's just the truth i think in a lot of ways like i said everyone has their own opinion some people really want the fortune and fame and then some people just do it for the kind of love of doing music and if it happens that the fame comes along it's it's great the only other thing that i gotta say is you know thanks again for taking the time to talk to us you were basically the standout because we had we did reach out to the others but again like you mentioned and uh, i found out myself they're not really active anymore yeah well i'm glad that i was able to uh to be on and hopefully that gave a little bit of some interesting trivia there thanks well, for having me well yeah i mean we see when i when i looked on the facebook and seen how many fa- or how many people responded to that because uh, you posted the truth clip and uh i was thinking like wow so i'm not the only one that misses rfr so that's kind of cool no it's nice because even now when i go out to just anywhere really i mean at least once or twice a day and, and that's <laughs> You know, I mean, certainly not as much as it was before, 15 years ago, obviously. But, you know, for 15 years later, to still have people come up and recognize you from that one show is pretty special. And, uh, and yeah, like I said, I always get those really heartfelt stories while, like, while it's happening. So it's just, it's really cool to be able to have it live on like that in people's hearts anyway. That's going to do it for this episode of Tobin Tonight. Our thanks to Kate Todd for coming on the show. Remember, you can find past, present, and future episodes on TobinTonight.com, Spotify, and iTunes. Follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and leave a comment or two. For Tobin and myself, this is Jacob saying, thanks to shows like Radio Free Roscoe, this podcast exists. 
wish we still had great Canadian-based shows like these for teens on television, or a channel which shows the reruns. Anyways, thanks for listening, and good night.